I'm Linda Chalker Scott, and I am the Extension Urban Horticulturist and Assistant Profe Associate Professor of Horticulture at Washington State University. I started off by being interested in marine biology, and I got my master's in marine biology, and taught college for a couple years, and decided I needed to get my PhD. So I went back to get my PhD in marine biology, and I couldn't get in because I hadn't been doing research, I'd been teaching. So I was um, kind of depressed, didn't know what to do, and I'd just recently gotten married, and my husband said, uh, well, you've always enjoyed plants, why don't you get a PhD in horticulture? So I really had had no academic interest in plants before. I'd grown up with plants, always had a garden, liked to collect plants when I was little and you know, press them and then tape them in a book and identify them and stuff, but never anything else. And so I thought, well, go back and get the PhD in horticulture and got into plant physiology and discovered that we don't know nearly as much about plants as we do about animals, humans. And so it was this huge void that I kind of stepped into, especially urban plants, you know, how plants function in urban landscapes, how, how do they survive, why do they die. So that's kind of the niche that I've built is um, being really interested in what, what's called plant stress physiology, but I just call it uh, kind of horticultural CSI. I, I am a lazy gardener, so I don't grow vegetables and I don't do anything that requires me to go buy new plants every year. We have a landscape and so I have no turf. Everything is in either ground covers and, and um, natural materials. We have little decks, we've got a pond, lots of trees and shrubs, um, bulbs, all kinds of stuff. It's a beautiful landscape and requires very little work. So that's good for me. I think the one that blows people away the most is um, one of the first ones I ever did, which was uh, the myth about putting uh, drainage material in containers. So you know, you always hear you're supposed to put pebbles or pot shards or sand or something to bottom of containers for drainage so that water drains through faster and actually does the exact opposite. And that one blew me away because you know, your, your, your head thinks, okay, you've got soil on top, then you've got gravel on the bottom, and when the water hits the gravel, it'll go so much faster because you've got all this space in between the gravel pieces. Well, what happens is that because there's this difference in texture between the soil and the gravel, the water actually stops when it hits the gravel and it moves sideways and it moves up. And then it's only when you get enough water that finally forces down. So you, it's called a perched water table. And so it makes the plants actually soggier than they would be if it was just solid material. And I mean, at nurseries, and you know this, that when nurseries pot stuff up, they don't put drainage material in their pots. It's solid media. And it's because it drains better that way. So there you go. That's one that I used to do. I, I mean, all the things that I've busted, all my myths, almost every one of them, with the exception of some really weird ones, are things I used to do. These things that just people think up and it sounds logical, and it's not. You know, so when someone actually does the science to test it, and there's been some wonderful experiments, visual experiments, to show what happens when water hits a, a different um, soil texture, you know, the, these cutaway things, it's really remarkable to watch. And when people see that, then they get it, but it's just because it doesn't make sense, intuitive sense, people don't get it. Well, if you ever want to really humble yourself, you, you Google yourself on the internet to find out what people say about you. And I will tell you, and I don't do this very often because one, I hate Googling myself, and two, I don't need to get more grief, but when it comes to some particular products, especially products that make people money, if you go after those products and demonstrate that they're not worth anything, um, you know, they're, it's taking a poke at their livelihood. So yeah, things like compost tea and some other things that, you know, have a bunch of money behind them, but not very much science, you know, because I take those on, then sure, you know, things get said. but. It's okay, and the nice thing for me is because what I do is all science-based, so it's not just stuff I research, but stuff other people have researched, and I collect that information. So I kind of feel like I have a whole bunch of people behind me that are supporting what I say. It's not just me against the world, it's me plus everybody else behind me against the world, and it's all right. Now permaculture is a combination of a philosophy of how you should treat a landscape and some methods, and some of them are good methods. So what they've done is they've taken some good methodology, some organic growing practices, and combined them with a philosophy about how to do a landscape and turn that into this, this kind of, <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's, it, just, it's, it just is. It's, it's not a science, um, but it has scientific parts to it. And it's really hard to tackle things like that because you can't say permaculture doesn't work because some things in it do work, but other things are not science-based. And so it, is, it becomes tricky to try to tease out the parts of the science that are actually good and useful. 
And in, in doing so, it's not just to tear it apart. What, it, it's what, what I try to do anyway is to get people to think about it, figure out what works and is science-based, and push the whole thing forward so it becomes a more credible method of, of growing plants. One of the things I talk uh, to people about is bare rooting uh, trees and shrubs before they plant. When I started doing this 10 years ago, it was really quite uh, controversial because you know one of the things I learned when I was doing my PhD working with plants um, is that you never disturb the root ball when you're transplanting because the whole thing will collapse and the tree will die. So you're not supposed to, you're supposed to be very careful with it. I remember planting my first landscape and just you know being really careful with everything. And then as the science has gone on, it turns out that, well, that's not really true. And actually the best way to get trees and shrubs to establish is to take everything off, to take off the burlap and the clay and the twine and the media and get the roots actually in touch with the native soil. That's how they establish. Because if you have all this, these barriers, they have, remember the thing with the, the, the soil and the gravel, water doesn't move through different barriers, roots don't move through barriers either. So if you take all this stuff off, you can get the roots to touch the native soil. You can um, make sure it's planted at grade because sometimes they're planted too deeply in the, in the pot or in the, in the ball and burlap. And thirdly, you can correct root flaws. So if you have any circling or girdling roots, you can cut them off. So I've been teaching this for a while. And um, one of the people that listened to me very early on uh, owned a owns a large landscape up in Canada. So she'd gone, to, she'd gone back home and she contacted her landscaper and she said, I want all my trees and shrubs planted bare root from now on. And so I met this landscaper several years later, and she's a, the president of a botanical garden up there, and she came up to talk to me. And she says, you know, I have to tell you, when I first heard your name, um, I hated your guts. <laughs> she said, because you made my life miserable, because my best client wanted me to bare root everything that, I, that she planted. And she's my client. I have to do what she wanted. And it was because of you. And she said, I hated you because I had to do this. But she said, she discovered that when she did this, that she didn't have to go back the year after and replace anything. She didn't have anything that was dead. And she thought about that, and she kept on doing for this client, planting everything bare root, never had replacements, ne nothing ever died. She now does her entire business this way because she said she had about a 10% year replacement rate because things, you know, they'll die. And now she replaces nothing, and she actually saves money. So that was a very cool thing because she's a business owner. She's looking at it from the bottom line, the economic part. Yes, it takes more time, but she saved money by doing it. So I thought that was very cool. And that's what sustainability is. It's a long game. Me and one of my colleagues um, at work have written an extension manual. We're now putting together a, like a workshop on, on critical thinking um, to increase scientific literacy of people working in plant professions, so arborists and nursery owners and everything else. And specifically what it is is to look at all this information that's on the internet and through open access journals and be able to look at the credibility, the relevance, um, you know, accuracy, and the purpose, it's what, the CRAAP test, C-R-A-P, um, to see whether it's good information or not, and then how do you use it. Because you're right, it's, you know, we don't teach this, and it's something that's really important.